Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to share with you this new interview for our Lumina channel. Um, this time, we have with us Hannah Ruth Dyson, founder of Soul Seed Gathering, who is joining us on the Hope Diary series. Hannah, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us. Yay, thank you for having me, Natal. And yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you. It's so good. Um, we're meeting on an afternoon um, to talk about hope and what really is inspiring us moving forward. You know, there's been many changes with the new era of Aquarius. There has been many changes as well with the pandemic taking over the world by storm. And I would like our viewers to learn more about Soul Seed Gathering. What's your work about and how has these different times that we are experiencing right now challenge you to rise to the next level? Mm, well, it's a big question. Um, yeah, this project has been kind of telling me what it is along the way. So I'm in constant discovery, but it's really rooted in research. We've been, um, I've been personally mapping the deep feminine. Um, so the largest aspect of our human history, uh, our prehistory, um, the deep sort of time of our human stories, but on, in particular, the women's um, side and the feminine lens. And so that sort of four or five years ago, um, sort of clashed more and more with present day cultures, but still present day indigenous cultures in particular. And I began doing this mapping work between um, finding the connections and really learning a lot about myself along the way with my own ancestry and um, yeah it's it's this conversations with indigenous female elders that has really um, rooted the project and guided the project and um, this is yeah been such a gift and such a beautiful unfolding we haven't really tried to force anything it's really just been where we've been asked where uh, we can offer sort of um, a platform to share people's experiences and sort of radically shift the academic model of outsiders researching people and more so we all can come together and learn um, from one another and our oral histories, our mythologies, our rituals and traditions and we have events around this, we have a yearly gathering and um, yeah through this turbulent time um, I'm, I guess I'm very glad to live here in Costa Rica in the jungle, um, first and foremost, because uh, it hasn't hit this little town or community um, much at all. And so um, in many ways, you can see what's going on around the world and realize, OK, there's a lot going on and a lot of shifts and changes. And um, whereas right here, like if I'm really present to my current reality, it's not um, very like in my face. But um, all of that to say, it's through some of the elders we've been able to have conversations with and with you as well, Natalia, um, helping us. Um, in particular, an interview we did with Shipibo elders, Laura and Leela. It was this reminder through this chaotic time to focus on the light of our own path. And that really helped me, I think, in that moment, hearing them. Um, this reminder that we can get so easily distracted by everything that's going on. And there's always gonna be things that can pull our attention. And um, I was trying to feel very spread thin rather than what I feel I'm really here to do, which is go deeper and really focus on my project and my work. So yeah, I guess through all of this turbulent time, I've learned more and more to hold boundaries and really focus on what I'm here to do. I find that very inspiring because um, it is easy to get distracted. <laughs> Not only, you know, going on social media and being in quarantine and in lockdown measures, sometimes we spend more time with the computer that we do with people because we are on very tight. I mean, the people that live in, in urban cities or in mega cities um, don't have that much space with nature, which, you know, let me to, to ask you how were you always connected to earth? How was your path to, you know, get into the deep feminine work, into the research? Mm -hmm. Well, if I look back, I can see it was always a part of me. I was very grateful to grow up on the south coast of Wales, 
Um, there's a lot of beautiful beaches and I lived in front of a park and forest. So I always had this connection to nature and um, also as a young child, I was learning about environmental disasters and the issues in the world. And I was feeling very passionate. I enjoyed, I joined the environmental club when I was age 10. I think they didn't even accept uh, children that young, but I called it up and I was like, I need to be part of this club. And um, yeah, that really stays with me, I guess, that memory. Um, but it, I guess I came a little bit away from that um, as I moved to London. I really remember feeling um, craving a little bit more nature. I was really grateful for this tree outside of my window in my, my flat in London, but it wasn't until I arrived in Canada, I had a two year visa to go um, work abroad there. And it was the first time um, I threw a mentor and a teacher there, Tina James, that I uh, met First Nations peoples, um, Barry and Clara in, um, in Lillooet in just outside of uh, Whistler, Wh Whistler. And um, that was radical for me because in Europe, you know, we hear about indigenous people, but we'd never like, you know, it's not so present in um, Europe. It's a little bit more hidden, our past, our ancestry um, connected to our indigenous roots, um, or it's a little bit mixed and blurred. But here I was um, experiencing this, um, this ritual and ceremony um, connection to the child that really made sense to me um, for the first time. I'd never been able to fully connect to religion. Um, I'd started to explore esoteric um, spirituality, but I, as spirituality, and that was huge for me because I was able to like really come alive through these rituals and ceremonies. So it's beautiful you ask that because alongside this research has been my personal journey of really reconnecting and finding authentic ways to be in ritual and ceremony myself and really stay rooted to, um, in particular, the cycles and the seasons and the elements and just really being attuned to my environment and, um, yeah, really paying attention to um, the more than human world. And that is just the richest sort of experience. I love that you shared your journey with us and I'm very thankful and appreciative for all that you have shared because it is easy when we are talking about entrepreneurship or social impact or empowerment, like to go the full, like, you know, no hurdles, no failures, no bad things happening. And, you know, the way that, you know, you are very true to what you did not know, what you learn along the way. And, you know, understanding that it's not about anti, anti anything, you know, it's, everybody has a personal journey to go through that leads them to launch an enterprise. And in your case, this journey um, led you to research and document the deep feminine, but you were also a researcher back in the, in the, in the past years. You were also a documentary researcher. Um, can you share with us how the deep feminine, researching the deep feminine actually changed your view of the world? Wow, it's another big question because um, it was like a little inkling I had this whole entire time, I think, growing up, like where, where in history are we learning about the women and why are we not learning about more than just wars and kings and queens and why are we not learning more about like these um, earth-based people and, um, and then also this feeling with feminism, like, wow, this is incredible but are we really saying that only just for the first time discovering equality and the answer to that is of course no there has been many examples and we can see through the archaeological record and it's an exciting time right now because it's finally being um, more recognized and more kind of I guess admitted yes of course there were times where it's very clear societies was like um, supporting the women at the center like new life, the mothers, the creation. It was important for the survival of tribes and clans and communities and villages and later bigger civilizations. This um, deep honoring and reverence of our womanhood and femininity and 
that being just inherently part of a society and it wasn't like the opposite of this society where women were kind of in charge and taking on this kind of a role it was more this egalitarian um, examples of society that really encompass the largest chunk of our human story if you look at the archaeological record you can see that and so this really deeply landed in me I hadn't like we always call our research like living research because it's changing and evolving and we are changing and evolving alongside it it's like you can't not start learning about um, these deeper truths or these deeper ways that we've lived and um, respected um, one another because if you look at our world today I think one of the biggest pains that we can feel as women is that um, there isn't this reverence for just um, we have to somehow kind of adopt um, and try and make a success in the sort of dominant system that isn't really designed for us and I think there's a deep pain in that um, we're not being respected just for our gifts inherently and things are changing of course but just recognizing wow we have like all over the world all cross cultures the deepest parts of our history the archaeological record was all like female figures these strong female forms empowered like owning their nudity and their body and just their there's a power to that and really sensing like wow this is something we've really forgotten and we've been cut off from and how much could this change who we are the way we see each other and possible in the world it's like super exciting Yeah, the, the connection is a bit unstable. Um, in the in the last part, can you um, share with us a, a bit of why? Um, I mean, I'm, I can send another question. <laughs> um, is there a reason? I mean, I get that there's a short time period of memory or historic memory of feminist movements, mostly based on the 20th century, but. I don't know what is at place, like what is the system or what are like the education maybe that we receive in the Western world that kind of, you know, um, disregards what all the, the, the previous um, colonies and all the previous um, tribes and forms of what you said, egalitarian systems, because, you know, the story that we, or the history <laughs> that we receive in our education systems, at least in the Western world, and I'm just going to rephrase, I'm from Puerto Rico, I've been receiving education from the United States. I don't know everywhere, like, what are the type of education that they receive, but in these specific scenarios, it is very limited, and us as women, when we are engaging with feminist movements, when we're engaging in women empowerment and women's rights and all that, we always reframe to, you know, like the universal uh, human rights um, uh, card or chart or, you know, the, the Beijing platform and all these conversations that you're sharing with us. And, you know, if people go to your social media, they will find like a treasure, <laughs> a treasure vault, because you are always posting incredible, like, you know, posts and information about different tribes, not only in Latin America, but worldwide. So I don't know if there's something in the system. This is just a question to see where it leads that is, you know, disconnecting women through their from their ancestry or their ancestral wisdom yeah i mean there's again so much within that because um you realize we're all kind of given a very narrow lens depending on the country that we've been in um i was pretty angry when i realized we didn't learn about britain's colonization across the world we didn't learn in school about india's occupation uh, britain's occupation in india like this is huge but it paints britain in a bad light so we don't learn about that i guess you know um and then we have this very i guess eurocentric um storyline that we're told and it's also told across the world also with this um 
emphasis on education. Let's educate the other people around the world, the developing nations and all these people. But it's usually through this Eurocentric lens and this story that we've created that is kind of um, cuts out most other viewpoints and lenses. And um, I was particularly angry that I initially that um, of um, the witch trials and women being persecuted and really seeing this internal colonization before colonization spread across the world. It makes a lot more sense um, rather than just, you know, taking on the, the feeling of guilt of what we've done to so many other countries. It's like so important to look what actually happened also within. So I always resonated with being Celtic and then looking actually deeper in the Welsh history, seeing that the Celts were also colonizers of the more earth-based people. They were more um, like a warlike tribe then than Christianity. And so, yeah, it's really um, these deeper, I think roots of our history help us understand who we are in the world and help us understand, um, give us kind of a stronger place to stand from. Um, when I started to understand that we weren't told the stories of you know, the persecution of women under the name of witch. And this happened over many generations. It wasn't just one generation. This happened over hundreds of years in ways. And I really think this you weren't persecuted, you were fearing being persecuted. So any woman in particular who had a voice, who didn't want to go with the Christian program, didn't want to go with the religious kind of um, um, movement, they wanted to stay connected to their earth-based practices. They wanted to stay connected to their own stories, their own rituals and so on, um, had to start going into hiding because it was clear, like if you, this fear of being labeled um, a witch could really, um, yeah, cost you your life. And then I think the more and more we kind of went underground, um, we also then just began to forget that happens across generations. You can track this with oral histories of um, different indigenous groups. For example, um, I, I can't pronounce their name, but there's a, an indigenous group on Vancouver Island, just off um, Vancouver. And they really have this oral history between the women of going into hiding, of remembering what happened because they realized how quickly the memory just got completely wiped um, of their people. They saw the first wave of colonizers coming and spreading disease. Then the second wave of colonizers coming and being more violent and bit by bit, it chipped away at their, the fabric of their life. And they had very much um, female elders in council being the leaders. And it was egalitarian, everyone had their role, everyone had their place and purpose, but um, bit by bit, this got completely eroded and the women had to go underground and hold on to this oral history um, because they could see that the men were starting to forget and many of the other women were starting to forget as the new generations came and colonizers also then began re-educating and relocating and, um, and being pretty violent. So when I heard that um, account, it really rang true. This is what's happened in Europe. We've also just forgotten. And there's also a fear of even speaking about that period of time because uh, we don't have any accurate records. So there's wildly different numbers of how many women were killed under the name of which, and there were some men as well, but predominantly women. And if we think about a whole attack on one gender, like out in the open where it was like, you are not, you know, able to um, express yourself. And we can see even accounts where there were even accounts of women being the more promiscuous, like uh, sex, the more pr promiscuous gender, watch out for those women. They have so many um, sexual needs and da, 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 da. And then you fast forward to the Victorian era and it's nearly like the whole memory has been wiped women don't have a sexual need, they're here to serve the men. And this is just becoming the current, like the, the dominant sort of belief system. And then you see that we've like, you know, evolved out of that space, but we've forgotten what happened before. And really when we look at archeology span being discovered by men in the Victorian era, really beginning to kind of create that as a sort of academic subject and to write about it, you see that they really built the foundation of our 
belief systems that have really imprinted the world in terms of how we see each other and how we see um, yeah, who we are compared to everyone else. Well, wow, that's super um, deep, <laughs> like the deep feminine. And um, we are gonna invite our viewers to check our description box because we will be listing a full episode on the deep feminine that we recorded with Hannah for you to learn more about all these beautiful knowledge and everything that's been doing at this uh, research house as well as the uh, magazine that Soul Seed Gathering has. Um, I'm very excited to um, ask you this question because a lot of people still don't understand what the feminine energy is and a lot of people don't understand what the deep feminine is and how actually both of them or just one you know can actually help us solve problems that we are living nowadays and this question is why researching or why remembering the deep feminine is actually gonna help us at a personal level or a collective level to solve problems that we are experiencing today? Yeah, I mean, first off, I, um, I personally find the conversation sometimes around what's feminine and masculine a little bit confusing. Um, and there's something that we began to notice um, when we sat with indigenous female elders and also younger indigenous female leaders um, that there was this different quality of being, different way of being that was much more, there was no people pleasing, there was no, um, you know, call for smiling, there was no, like, going through the motions of politeness, you really had to win trust, very clear boundaries, very strong sense of self, and it really occurred to me that, wow, this is what we're talking about in women's empowerment movement. This is what we're trying to get back to. And these women have it inherently. They have this strength of self and have no problem with boundaries. Um, and so actually being around some of these women, it was just like really powerful because as we can talk about things all the time, but it's not until we're actually in the presence of someone embodying, I guess, the virtues that we're trying to achieve that we recognize, oh wow, this is something I can learn from and shift within my being and um, tangibly see how it, how it like um, represents in life. And yeah, it, it's um, something that I think we're missing. This idea of femininity is always soft and gentle and sensuous and passive and sweet. Um, but I really, I feel like coining this term, the deep feminine just felt really important because there was this nearly like I was a deeper remembrance of perhaps the strength of femininity. And of course, when I'm talking about those descriptions, it's very much, again, from the mainly Eurocentric model of femininity. And I think, again, a lot of those roots of that description is from um, likely, you know, these puritanical Victorian era sort of times. Um, whereas if you look across cultures, there's many different qualities of the feminine. And of course, we can embody many different uh, qualities within ourselves. But there's this um, strength of voice and fierceness and, um, yeah, and uh, you know, just this ability to express the full spectrum of emotion. And I think any woman who experiences birth gets a sense of, wow, this is a power. Like this is a force and this is coming through the feminine this is coming from the woman um so it doesn't quite ring true to me this simplification sometimes of the feminine and masculine like i'll hear women say i'm getting into my masculine to you know show up and get stuff done and i i i think when we think of birth i'm like there's a force that we can tap into there's a deeper well of power and wisdom that you know men and women can, any gender can tap into, but it's one that maybe we're a little bit af afraid of in our modern world. And we're a little bit un in a, unaccustomed to in our modern world. And it takes a little bit of strength to really embody it because people will really notice. And, and you might also trigger a lot of people in that state. As an entrepreneur, on a very difficult subject or sensible subject that is, you know, ancestral women's wisdom all around the world, how have you been able to protect 
your enterprise from criticism on you know all these white savior complex and all these different um, conversations on race which are you know taking um, charge now and also from if you know from other um, economic downturns because we are on a pandemic <laughs> and a lot of things are happening so what are what has got gotten you through this period mm, wow well I realize the most important thing is to not be trying to rush anything and really staying like in tune with myself and making sure I'm doing the work to really be in integrity and to really know myself and know what my part is in this project and in this journey and really grateful um, back to when we plumbed in and the Kogi tribe there because that was a really huge moment for me where I was very clearly told the message was that I can no longer hide behind this project there and I recognized how important it was how vital it was to our conversations that we include more voices and more perspectives and I wasn't finding what I was looking for so I knew I had to create it but for many years I was hiding behind it I didn't really want to be seen or have the voice of it I um, yeah, I felt very uncomfortable around that. And the message with, in Colombia um, with the Kogi and with these women was very much, I had to be the voice in the face of it. And just to share my experience and to um, really be learning out loud also and be willing to make mistakes and um, to know what the actual intention and the deepest why of this project and this work is. And that helps me stay really strong because when I'm rooted in that, like this is what it's really for. If someone's gonna judge me because they don't really know me or they're gonna judge the project, they don't quite understand. Or, I mean, everyone's kind of a little bit walking on eggshells right now. because it's like this sense of cancel culture or stepping out of line and um, you can really be torn apart. And I, of course, can feel sensitive to that, but I keep coming back again and again to my deep rooted why. And knowing that I'm doing really the best that I can, I'm really paying attention, I'm really listening, I'm really open to criticism and feedback and really evolving and growing and learning and that's the best that I can do. And when I'm really strong in that, like I'm really strong in the why, and I'm really strong in this um, acknowledgement that I know myself, that I know that I'm doing the best that I can and I'm constantly learning also and to have good advisors around me and to have good counsel and people that I trust um, is everything. So that's really helped me navigate these times um, because the work is more important than I guess my ego or you know needing to be liked by everyone. I'm, I'm inspired by these women, right? Who embody this strength, who don't need to people please. I'm like inspired. I'm like, I'm developing those qualities over time as well. Yeah, I feel uh, similar in a sense because once you connect with your why, you know, everything else is just noise. It's like, there's not something that can, you know, actually anchor you to the earth than knowing what you're here for. And, you know, if you're launching a business or you have, you know, an enterprise or a social impact campaign, or you're working on women's issues, you need to know where you're going, you know, and, you know, not let all the noise distract. I mean, it's good to, you know, listen to feedback and criticism and try to, you know, make changes, but not let it deter you. And I feel one of the reasons why we launched this hope series for the YouTube channel was because people are losing hope. And um, I'm not actually you know, talking about like all the general people, but actually the change makers are also losing hope. People that are, you know, launching, you know, social entrepreneurship uh, ventures and, you know, that are doing amazing work. They are, you know, um, you know, losing hope because there's a lot of fear going around, not only through government protocols, but also through media, as well as family members and, you know, the collective and communities. And that's so different. If there's maybe one thing that connects you to the energy of hope, what could it be? What has been your connection? 
to hope. <laughs> well, it doesn't lie in mainstream media or always on social media. <laughs> I think um, being connected to some of these communities, these wise elders, really um, soaking in this wisdom, um, elders who in some ways have prophesized this time, have seen this kind of chaos and this destruction taking place as part of a greater cycle of change and that we are moving into this direction of um, you know creating something new again and really when I, I, I feel that I feel that I feel that this is necessary to a certain extent and while it's still in, like infused with a lot of pain and loss and confusion and and chaos, I, I feel, yeah, really, I guess, rooted in my work is giving me hope because I see all this potential, all this untapped knowledge, all this, um, yeah, wisdom that we're yet, like we're cut off from in the modern world. And if we just begin it because I know it firsthand, I know how my personal life has shifted through this work, through connecting to myself in a deeper way, honoring this deep feminine aspects within myself has really helped me come back into balance, I think, with the masculine or with all people in my life. And I feel, I guess, really nourished by my family, by my children, by my partner, where we live, I feel really grateful and just really um, grateful for the mundane as well. I think often the most beautiful moments that I soak in always sometimes the most mundane in many ways. And I'm really, yeah, just grateful to be here and grateful to be part of this change taking place on the earth. And I have two questions last for you. The first one is, how can we find hope as a society? Of course, this is a very general question, but maybe if you could give us just a tip so we can start collecting through the whole series. Well, very, one, it comes back to simple. I think really important to pay attention to sleep, good food, water, it's actually amazing just changes in our diet or changes in all things that we consume. So really looking first at what are we influenced by in our life? Because this is huge. Once we start to eat more healthily um, and are nourished by good conversations and not just like scrolling or like looking at the newsreel or whatever, and we're actually being inspired in a really rich way. And we're really um, around community that can like lift us up and like remind us to laugh and play also and to you know find those like little joys I think as a society we need to connect to that and I really hope that with this um, lockdown isolation social distancing we're re remembering and recognizing oh, this is the most important thing human connection community is one of the most important things. And it's something that I'm actively working on to really build stronger relationships and connections so that we can feel like we can rely on one another as a community and we're not isolated. And that is, um, yeah, full of hope for this world. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, any upcoming projects, any ways that we can support your work? Hmm. Well, we close our doors um, for our year-long journey this 27th, February 27th. I'm not sure when this will be released, but there's still an opportunity to jump in. Um, and otherwise, we open our doors again in summer. So there's a second opportunity to join, no matter when you're listening. And that's an opportunity to kind of really go into our research house, into our library. You can also support us on Patreon and just be a member there and just like receive some updates and wisdom and the knowledge from our archives. Um, but this deep feminine soul journey is guiding us to sort of marrying this knowledge and our personal journey. And I think it's through those depths that we get to all also the beauty and the, the laughter and the play and the fulfillment. So that's a major way. And otherwise just find us on Instagram. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the app Clubhouse. I'm about to start like, 
um, sharing perhaps a weekly circle on there. So stay tuned to that. And on our email list, we share everything as we go also. That's amazing. I've never heard of that app. So I need to put myself in current, in current times. I will list all the links to um, Hannah's work and Soul Seed Gathering down below in the description box. And I can say from the first hand experience that the work that Hannah is doing and everybody at Soul Seed Gathering is incredibly transformative. And for people that are seeking, you know, a different conversation a different action plan to connect with their soul to engage better with nature with wisdom to hear one another they are building a beautiful community full of hope so i'm very excited that um we got hannah here to join us at this uh, new series that we're launching on the lumina channel and um hannah thank you so much for joining me mm, thank you natalia such an honor and um yeah so excited that you're doing the series it's really important yeah thank you